Is philosophy some kind of undying snake issuing from chaos? Is it supposed to be some kind of verklish kite or sprung? Uh, a real origin? Real origin of man? Is it supposed to tell us the origin of the human being? Is it supposed to give us a contrast to the biological concept of the human being, a contrast to the Catholic or Christian concept of the human being. So, I want to ask what philosophy is, and the way I'm going to try to ask it is by talking about my experiences with Leo Strauss, with his thinking, and with Martin Heidegger, with his thinking. And especially bring in Nietzsche because Nietzsche touches both of them. So, uh, many things I may say may seem idiotic or absurd, but uh, that's partly because I have to flail around, but it's also partly because, uh, as Leo Strauss said, quoting Soren Kierkegaard, everything can't be said at once. So it's, it's, uh, some things make sense only when you have other knowledge. It seems like from the perspective of Nietzsche, we have life, quote-unquote life, is somewhat vague. Um, it sometimes gives you a sense of what life means by speaking of animals. Other times it says, uh, I was born as a vegetable, and at some time I got some paideia or I got some education, I became a human being. You can think about it that way. Animals have, in each way of thinking, they never even get to the point where they can forget. They're in an immediate environment. And in a way, I think Nietzsche is aware and when we talk about an animal, that when we make these kind of distinctions, we're in a kind of complex of thought already. So you have this Christian complex of thought where there's minerals, there's vegetables, there's animals, there's human beings. That's a, some kind of modification of Greek thinking. And you're already in this mythical structure and you know everybody knows that Nietzsche talked about this uh, remote planet where the human beings invented knowledge so Herder Herder says we didn't invent knowledge it came all of a sudden because we didn't against Kant we didn't invent language language and knowledge go together language knowledge and reason go together language knowledge and the human being go together as so far as the Greeks are concerned, everybody knows this form of definition where they talk about an animal, a genus, an animal, and then specific difference, the reasoning animal, the speaking animal. Uh, but Herder says, no, the language is sort of just shows up. No against Kant, not no against the Greeks. But uh, So Nietzsche seems to be quite aware when he talks about the myth and he speaks very ironically and he speaks all the time in a sort of ridiculous way. I have that kind of way of talking too, so I don't want to throw in all the time these kind of Jordan Petersons. Uh, I'm really serious about that. I'm serious about that. I'm serious about this or that. In a way, I take that for granted. I think Nietzsche has to take that for granted too. Uh, the, the whole reflection is serious. And... Um, But on the other hand, uh, as Leo Strauss said, if you read Plato, Plato says things like, uh, you want to be not always uh, laughing because the young men make fun of what you're saying. Uh, but at the same time, Plato had this cloven hoof, as uh, Leo Strauss put it. There's a cloven hoof of Plato. Plato is making jokes all the time. Same thing that they're... Uh, Plato said, uh, somewhere in Plato, in Plato's writings, Plato didn't speak 
straightforwardly himself, as Leo Strauss always brings out, there's the opinion that laughter is predatory, as a primarily used mockery, but Plato himself says about a mockery of this. Started off by speaking of the Kant. So Kant has something that we could call the philosophy of Überhaupt. Philosophy von Überhaupt, who like um, Überhaupt means in German everything, but that's not. It doesn't have to mean that. It can also mean you can look at the word. You can look at some old uh, Werder book, some old uh, lexicon, and you can come up with the idea that. Uh, Oberhaupt can mean overhead. So then you can say the whole theme in Kant, uh, the phenomena, has to do with only the things we can observe. And you can't add on to that solen. You can't add on to that the ought, the things ought to be. There's, and in fact, by Kant's own rule, the is, that he says, uh, some money that you have that is, is no different uh, than some money that possibly could be, because otherwise you wouldn't be talking about the same thing. It doesn't add anything. So you could say, it doesn't add anything to say, this money ought to be here, or this money ought to be paid. It's the same, by the same standard, the ought has no special standing. And this idea of uh, a free will that somehow is forced teleologically to choose a certain end. Um, it has a dogmatic flavor to it, if you analyze it according to the kind of logic that Georg Simmel and that people at the end of the 19th century still respected. Uh, it becomes more unclear the more you think about it, as does philosophy overhaupt become more unclear the more questions you ask. So um, let's start with Heidegger. Uh, in order to say something about Heidegger, let me say something about Herder. Herder said that uh, he confessed uh, I have been very idiosyncratic and he contrasts idiosyncratic with reasonable so uh, there's something about Heidegger seems to be against the tradition of reason that he wouldn't he doesn't like it we don't he doesn't say against because it's too crude because it's supposed to give your Mixing with the cognoscenti in the, uh, you know, the rhetoric department or in the, um, the department that deals with uh, continental philosophy, so-called, and the people talk about binaries all the time. And um, Heidegger has a great way of avoiding all these kind of... Uh, formulations that the cognoscenti or the intellectuals as they would frown upon and he does that all the time he's constantly running through these so he says things instead of saying it's the opposite you know gagan uber is the opposite he says something like uh it's closer to the opposite and instead of speaking of being against something said he'll say uh you have to confront something you have to set it out apart and, and really confront it. So this confrontation or aus ein ander setzung. So it's anders, other, set it apart, has to do with really um, giving the thing its own value, uh, making it into an enemy in this sense that, um, I want to mention also that um, it's not just Carl Schmidt that talks about enemies. Herzl talked about enemies. He said that the Zionist, the Zionist movement needed enemies. So uh, I make that comment in order to say Heidegger lived in a certain historical period. And 
if you read Plato, when he sets his his dialogues, usually there's a little uh, there's a human setting. They tell you when it's happening, who's involved. People are. It's not. It doesn't have uh, the abstract sense of merely making quote unquote arguments. So because people have opinions, they're in the middle of their in media is raised, they're in the middle of life. And um, so we have this problem of the, what I call genetic circle, which is as soon as we start talking about something, we come up with other considerations and say Heidegger is in the middle of life like everyone else. But then uh, Heidegger, the philosophy, has certain dictates that he wants us to follow, and then one of them is supposedly that he doesn't want us to talk too much about the biography of a, a philosopher. So he says something about that in his introduction to Aristotle, or one of his early lectures. He mentions that, and uh, he's also throughout his life he talks about um, Heidegger in the third person. You know, Heidegger is wrong about this. Heidegger is right about this. Uh, so there's multiple explanations for that. One is he doesn't want to be psychoanalyzed. Another is, uh, you know, the, uh, Heidegger had um, the Oedipal complex or whatnot, and therefore he wrote this or that. Uh, some kind of version of what they called uh, genetic fallacy, you know, just accusing somebody um, everything that flows from this font is wrong. Uh, uh, which is the opposite of that would be say everything Aristotle says is right because Aristotle is the great authority. We always have to have a little bit of judgment about that. At the same time, all these I have a strong distaste for logical fallacy talk because you put that down as a, a as though it settled some kind of argument and it's not it, it takes us away from really grappling with the issue um the other the third so you have you know the, the other way to understand this uh the philosophy the philosopher just has a biography is born somewhere died somewhere forget about his biography biographical life is that we don't want to be obstructed uh, by extraneous matters and Heidegger himself didn't want to be obstructed by what quote-unquote Heidegger the Heidegger as a title to his philosophy thought he wanted to be constantly open constantly thinking what was quote-unquote worthy to be thought in the ordinary thing I have to say, anyone by ordinary standard would think you want to be open and you want to be... Well, that's not entirely true because we also like this idea that people take a stand on things and they have a, a, a position, they formulate a position so you can attack it. Uh, ordinarily, we do talk about polemics and attacking and about debate. Heidegger would not really particularly like that and we talk about more elevated discussion also and there's all the kinds of talk about it. are you talking about the argument or are you insulting the person my own view is that ultimately um, the earth sprung of sophistry in the negative vernacular sense as it's not now used not in the sense of the historical sophists and all these problems that uh, Derrida and others bring out and Heidegger brings out and everybody brings out, but in the vernacular sense of sophistry as quibbling as the lawyers play a game and this kind of thing, I think that the or fallacy, quote unquote, is to separate the human being from the statement. I don't believe that. I think the sophist tries to separate the statement and make the statement stand on its own. And it's useful to point out when that happens. It's useful to point that out, but you can't insist on it in the, as though it settles all kinds of arguments. It doesn't settle arguments.
It doesn't settle the issue. The human being and language are tied up together, and that's a big part of this issue that uh, in Herder, uh, thinking and language go together, and thinking is what links things and makes them what they are. And so, for instance, this is an argument about uh, a tear, uh, a tear taken apart from the situation of the emotions involved ceases to be a tear. And it becomes something that it's, we still call it a tear because that was the origin of the coming to awareness of that phenomena of the tear. And it's not just a phenomenon, it's not just a, a something we observe, quote unquote. Uh, it's not merely, quote unquote, objective, but it's something we're totally involved in, and then it gets separated out. So this becomes a big theme that we have to struggle with right now, which is that uh, there's this fashion. In a way, it's just a fashion. It's it, that everything is supposed to be about spatial temporal uh, matters, and I even heard it, uh, some that his name is something like Johannes uh, Niedermeyer or something along those lines, and he says. Um, German is a spatial temporal language. Um, English is a, about a, a language about observation. And this is it itself, um, I think this is not really true. You have, it's, you can make, uh, say, Gesundheit in, the, in German is a healthy English. You can make the same kind of words. Anyway, you can make the same kind of words in German and English. It's not that harder but uh, I don't think that's that's neither here nor there but I think it's connected to a fashion that it's uh, even the people that are trying to follow Heidegger fall into these fashions like uh, so I was thinking of Lucio uh, what's the name of the artist Lucio Fabiano Lucio Fontana, Lucio Fontana. So his slashing works, his works where he cuts his canvas in the late 50s, he prides himself on being spatial, not about just the observation of a flat painting. So this is part of a, you know, the middle 20th century avant-garde, if you like. These ideas are... They flow, and it all flows from the coming of this great separation of the objectivity of the, the concept of the sciences that has been in power since about 1900, where everything's about what you can observe, what you can measure. And that plays a big role in Heidegger. So then there's the big fashion, but oh, but we don't want to be just about what we can observe and measure. That goes all the way back to Kant and the philosophy of Überhaupt, just the phenomena, not the inside, uh, not the emotions even, because the emotions are basically bring you into what uh, the third critique into taste. And there's actually, there's no way to make a distinction, I believe, between matters of taste and matters of morality. They're just, there's just an ascending scale. The matters of morality are more important. Uh, I say that in as long as we're thinking about it in the Kantian frame, in the way Kant thought about it. So Leo Strauss, Leo Strauss, I think in many ways is is very opposite of uh, Heidegger, and the one way to say that is to say Strauss is about reason, uh, and where uh, Strauss reason is connected to politics, which is a solid subject, and to political philosophy, which he understands as the art of politics. So. Um, you can understand what that means very easily by thinking of the founding fathers of America and they read people like Montesquieu, they read people like Cobbs, and they took what they, they read and that was, uh, they used that to produce the Constitution. So this is the, um, this is the political art, the political art. Make a political order out of this uh, thinking. Uh, so Strauss understands First philosophy, not as metaphysics. First philosophy, not um, 
because the reflections of a trauma or a dream or a superfluous uh, and wild, uh, woolly thinking, but as they attempt to improve a political order in a concrete way. And reflections about that. Heidegger understands uh, first philosophy, philosophy as metaphysics, and he glosses or shrinks metaphysics to the phrase uh, theory of the object. I think of a theory, uh, I mean, it's theory in the Greek sense of the theorist, the theorist, for the theorist. Uh, Eorus was originally somebody who went and looked at the uh, religious practices of neighboring groups. And you see this in the uh, Republic. Um, uh, Socrates looks at this Thracian bandist, this god uh, that's come from Thrace, to have some kind of um, display among, uh, at, the, um, at the port in Athens and this is an onlooker and this is for the Greeks the highest form of practice is just this onlooking and just uh, and there's also the end of the Republic there's this is the myth of error so it's another form of uh, sort of tourism high the highest form of tourism in a way if you want to put it in the um, appreciatory way but uh, You can say the whole of Heidegger is trying to go back before the Greeks determined everything as presence or availability uh, to the onlooker. And in contradistinction to that, Strauss wants to stay with reason or rationality, which seems to be going in the opposite direction of attempting simply... uh, to, as he says, change things for the better or keep things as they are for the better. Because you might, in some situations, you might think it's too risky to make a change, and especially if you're in, just come out of uh, World War II and uh, you're in the midst of the Cold War and you're saying, well, maybe it's better we should just, we should keep things the same because that is for the better right now. Uh, whereas uh, you're more confident about the world situation, you might say, let's make some changes, and that would be for the better. And you might have confidence that you can carry off those changes. So... Um, the way I want to try to answer this question of what is philosophy is by further reflections on actual philosophers. I tried to enter into the thinking and uh, by trying to think. So... So let's take a look at uh, one issue in Heidegger. Uh, It's not exactly an issue, it's just a usage. So Heidegger likes to talk a lot about the uncanny. The uncanny uh, is uh, unheimlich or um, unatomedness. But he doesn't exactly use it that way. It's not that... um, And he uses it seemingly to mean... One thing he uses it to mean something very good. So he uses it to mean the the very realm of the philosopher. And this seems to mean that thinking is the human essence. But thinking isn't 
the same as reason. Reason means somehow a platonic discussion where I say something like, here's a table, here's a tree, here's a fisherman, here's an angler, and then I come to these higher discussions like, uh, here's this idea of reason, and I have the idea of reason sort of in my hands, and then I can treat it as something I speak about in a consistent manner, and I can impose some rules on it, and I can say, oh, you said this five minutes ago, and now you're saying that, and I can say, you're uh, basically you're lying in a way, and that's, um, I mean, lying is the simpler in a way that's what uh, contradiction means. It's like you said one thing earlier, now you're saying something else. That could be a mistake. Pseudos in Greek is supposedly indifferent between lying and making a mistake, but the Greeks were fully aware of the difference between lying and making a mistake. Uh, even if the language at the time of the fourth century didn't bring that out in a word. Uh, it, they were aware of it already it, very clearly in Iliad and Odyssey. Many, hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, if not a thousand years earlier. Uh, I mean, a man says one thing in his heart and he says another thing out loud. He had lines like that in, um, in Iliad and Odyssey. Uh... So Heidegger speaks of the Unheimlich as a praise often, and it seems to be connected with the idea of ascending, ascending to the, in the sense of Plato's cave metaphor, which I take to mean in this basic determination that the people have opinions and they try to ascend to knowledge. But in Heidegger, there is no knowledge. So the ascent is to the Unheimlich. And when Heimlich is the core of the human being. And so, for instance, there is a passage in Sophocles that Heidegger, he switches out the usual translation where it speaks of uh, something like human beings are the most wonderful. Or there's wonders all about. There's many wonders. But the most wonderful of all is the human being. But instead he says, there's uncanny things all about the most, but the most uncanny is the human being. Um, there's a lot of things in Heidegger that, that, that uh, rely on this kind of etymological treatment. It's never clear how so far he deserved to be... Um, slam down for misuse, for um, abuse of this kind of uh, possibilities. It's never simply a matter of making things up uh, or, you know, just making things up as you go along. There's a serious intent behind it, but on the other hand, there's usually it's possible to distinguish uh, what Heidegger would call correctness, um, correct philological. A correct philological treatment of a text can usually be distinguished from the experiments even of uh, great philosophy. Um, the status of correct access to the text, correct classical philology is one of the things that's in question. Um, I think of the line in Plotinus where Plotinus says uh, we came to the penetralium, to the innermost point of the temple, and then we left the temple images behind. All the things that are hanging around available to us, including correctness, must at some point be left behind. So I'm not saying that Heidegger thinks in the same way as Plotinus, but the um, the image, the analogy overhangs the way Plotinus thinks and the way Heidegger thinks, and you can um, overlay that. Um, 
superimpose it if you like. 